All right. Okay, so I am Jam Risser. I'm a software architect at Silicon Hills, and I like playing around with React, Docker, and Node. Um, so the topic that I'm going to be talking about is inversion of control. And I guess to start, I guess I should say that I really like Node.js. I really like JavaScript, but JavaScript and Node have its problems that I'm well aware of, and I'm not going to brush under a rug. Um, for example, I don't know if you guys, I thought about putting this uh, meme on my computer screen, but it's so overused, I would look silly. But um, if you've seen that meme with the uh, heaviest object in the universe, node modules, um, you know, like, I'm not actually solving that problem. I did come up with a solution one time. It was, you know, go watch Netflix while they're downloading, but then my Netflix is just buffering, so it just didn't work out very well. Um, anyways, but okay, so another problem that Node, the Node ecosystem or just Node projects kind of have, or at least I've seen have in the past, is when a project begins to get big and begins to get really large, it has trouble scaling. And I'm not talking about scaling across servers, I'm talking about scaling across developers, um, scaling across um, just you know, a large team of developers and just being able to keep the platform updated and things like that. To the extent that I have worked with several platforms that are still using Node 0 0.12. And the reason for that is because they either use Node 0 0.12 or they rebuild their platform. And there's 20 developers on the project and they're not going to rebuild their platform. So I guess this topic is kind of how can you how can you write your Node JavaScript platforms in a way that can handle scaling at that type of level? And so one way of doing this that's been done in many other programming languages is this um, programming paradigm called inversion of control. And um, in JavaScript, it's kind of not really been done a lot. There's been a few approaches to it, but the main reason is it's kind of awkward to do in JavaScript, mainly because you really need interfaces to make it feel natural and to, to really leverage the power of it. So before I guess, get more into inversion of control, let me kind of give you guys a bit more context of inversion of control. So traditional programming that we usually do um, is just procedural programming. And um, procedural programming, it's a programming paradigm where a series of blah, 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 whatever. It's basically, you know, just do this, do this, do this, do this. Um, and we get a little bit smarter about it. You know, we like to reuse our logic. So we end up having our, our custom logic, our business logic, and we end up having that go and use these reusable libraries, AKA heaviest <laughs> objects in the universe. Um, and, you know, NPM install and we're good to go and things seem great. Um, so that's in comparison to inversion of control, which basically does it the other way around. So it's a design principle, which custom written portions of your program, your custom code, receive the flow of control from a generic framework. So basically you have your framework, which then calls into your custom logic. And a very common inversion of control paradigm that's used is dependency injection. And that's not brand new to Node. That's not brand new to JavaScript if you use Angular. Um, so let me just explain a little bit more how that works. So you have reusable libraries. So how do we use, you know, with inversion of control, we don't want just our framework and our custom logic. We still want these reusable libraries. So our reusable libraries get loaded into the framework at boot time, and it builds a graph of all of these dependencies that are in our framework that our programs have access to. And then our custom code can then call into those, call into that dependency graph and access the, the code. And then, of course, um, our custom code will then go and call back into the framework for other dependencies. And so that's why you have this dependency graph. And this is basically a just really solid IOC control pattern. And um, yeah, so I inversion of control, kind of what are the advantages of it? Um, 
com uh, composability. Um, you know, you can just kind of pick and choose the things that you want in your code. Uh, it's also, um, I would say it's very reusable um, across different platforms. Your code, you can move it from project to project very easily. And uh, it's kind of durable across time. You can take your, your logic and you can update it in an isolated fashion. And so if you have a huge platform, you can have developers go and, ice and um, work on updating these isolated parts of the platform. And then when it's all ready, you know, deploy your new platform. Going back to that 0 0.12 platform, you can't really do that. You, it's either all or nothing, basically. So uh, composability. I want to talk about composability a bit. So composability, again, is also not brand new to JavaScript, not brand new to the Node ecosystem. My favorite um, usage of composability is React components. There's a very that's a great example of composability, and I love them. But try building a web server with React components that does API endpoints. You technically could because it's a virtual DOM, so I could uh, you know, write a React reconciler that takes my React components and <laughs> calls it <laughs> into API endpoints, but that just doesn't sit well with me, nor do I feel like taking the time to do that. So how do we bring composability into backend frameworks. And again, that's our dependency injection. So examples kind of speak better than, than uh, PowerPoint sometimes. So let me just give you guys a real basic example of how I did this. So I have a little um, API here that, let's see, let me just start it up. This is using Loopback 4. Uh, Loopback 4 is, um, uses TypeScript. And so since TypeScript has interfaces, that's why you can use dependency injection in a way that feels, it just feels right. So um, let's go to the API, get our little swagger doc. So fortune, if you've ever had a fortune cookie, right? It just tells you random things. So this is just tying straight into the um, fortune command line. And it's just gonna give us a little random fortune quote. I'll actually just do it in here, it's uh, here, it's just easier. Okay, so there's our API, it's working. Um, but we want this to be composable, right? So this, uh, this um, library that's, that's doing this quote is, it's, uh, which one is it using? Okay, I'm using this, and going back to this um, reusable libraries, right? We start with reusable libraries. I decided to use reusable libraries in this. So I'm using this library called uh, random quote, uh, let's see, random quote, it's random quote. Yeah, get random quote, okay? So I'm using this library called get random quote. It gives me a random quote. The way it gives me the random quote is it sends me a promise with an object on it with, that has a property called text. Okay, that's the way this one works. But there's another library in here called fortune, fortunes. All right, another NPM module. And this one works very differently, but it does the same sort of thing. It gives me a random quote um, using the uh, fortune command line. And this one works very differently. This one, you call it and you pass in a callback and the callback gives you the uh, string result of your quote. So they're very, very different. So in a traditional, going back to that procedural programming, you'd write out your logic, you know, your platform that's gonna last for ages and you, use fortunes in your project and then the project gets deprecated and five years down the road, your platform's stuck or you're gonna to have to rewrite all your APIs that interface with this library. So that's not what I want to do. So that's, so yeah. So let's talk about how this works. So we create a service and this service is an interface, okay? An interface, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with interfaces, is basically a, a, a pre-established contract between the consumer of the interface and between um, what's going to provide the functionality for the interface. So for this interface, the contract basically says we'll have a class that, we'll have a property or I guess a function that called fortune that we can provide and it's gonna send us back as a string result, the um, random quote. So this 
this interface can then be used or injected because this is a dependency injection. It can be, it'll get injected at boot time. Um, you don't need to know all these lines of code, but this is basically the line that injects it. We bind uh, the, the service to a provider. And um, so we have that bound in that, so the interface is this fortune service interface. So we bind, we bind the, the logic that actually, imp the implementation of that interface, we're binding into the dependency injection system, the implementation of it. And that's this get random quote provider that I was showing up here where we, where, where we implement it. And then we can use it in our controller by injecting it, which we just, just do a dependency injection. And then we can, um, down here, we can actually access the service and execute the fortune uh, function, which gives us the string back as a promise, not as fort, which fortune does, uh, like I said, does a callback. So it's, that, that's what our um, fortune provider is doing. It's taking the, the way that fortune works and, and rewriting it so that it, it matches the interface so that, so that it works with our fortune interface. And it works and it's great. So now what I wanna show you is this, um, let's see, the one I just demonstrated was get random quote. So you can see here, I have my get random quote service provider, which implements get random quote, and I have the fortune service provider commented out. So if I switch them and down here, I switch them, that's it, that's all I have to do. I don't have to rewrite any of my business logic. My business logic stays the same. And let's try, I gotta restart it. Let's try restarting it. I think it restarted. It did not restart. No, because it's not throwing an error. Um, let's see. Oh, okay. It's, maybe it's just taking time. It's just taking time. Okay, restarted. Boom. And that's that's using that different underlying library that's inside of it. So I guess to recap, um, this will not only allow you to, as you know, maybe the APIs change on you, you can just go into your service provider and just modify how, how it works with that interface. You don't have to touch any of your actual implementation logic. And, um, or if I'm guessing like another good example is let's say you write a service that sends text messages and you're using Twilio as the backend, you can write that as a service and then you switch text providers. You just rewrite the way that it works with the interface and all your logic that's sending those text messages in your application. You don't have to go through all that code and rewrite it. So that's it. Any questions? Yes, go ahead. Right, so let's, let's say the data type changes. So your interface is that contract that tells you how it's gonna work. So if your interface changes, yes, you have to change how it's working inside of your application. Um, the idea is your, your interface can change and changing your interface is gonna be work, especially if you, know, if you add another function to your interface, it's probably gonna be fine. But um, if you, if you actually change one of the existing functions that's being used and change the data types being returned, it'll break. So ideally what you'd wanna do, if you can, depending on your, your problem, when you create your service provider, right? So this get random quote, this returns a promise. Um, Fortunes does not return a promise, Fortune does a callback. So ideally if you can, if, the, if you're just getting the same type of information just in a different way, you'd like just rewrite the way to make it match your interface. And if that's not possible, you could, um, if, you're, if you wanna keep backwards compatibility, you could make a new function 
like a whole brand new function because it's going to be returning a different data type. And let's just say it's worst of worst case scenarios. And for some reason, like the, the library you're using in existence for some reason has to, you know, maybe like node upgrades and you want to use the newest version of node and like there's some underlying API and it changes the data type to the point where there's new pieces of information you need and it's just not backwards compatible, then I mean, I guess you would have to rewrite all your logic, but that's pretty, pretty rare case. It's pretty common case for an API developer who makes a library to change some little thing in their API that breaks your whole app and causes you to spend a lot of work rewriting all that. And that's what this solves. This solves that problem. That's like very, very common. That happens all the time. This is, you know, this is why if you're using node 0.12, you have to shrink wrap your packages so that it bakes in all those old dependencies. So. So I think I might have interpreted the question a tiny bit differently. So in a strongly typed language, IOC frameworks sometimes have you attribute the lifecycle type of the instances that are delivered by what is being like instantiated by the framework. Is that what you mean? Where you can label it as singleton or like, you know, you can create a provider that does like round robin distribution of like 10 instances or it always give you a new instance. Yeah. So I don't know if that's in this framework or not, but I would bet the simplest way to do it would be modifying the value function right there uh, to instead of bringing you to this dot fortune, you know, this dot fortune, they could bring you, you know, a right. new fortune or delegate which, to some other thing that gives you something from a, um, you know, a pool. Which, which if you modified like the data type it returns, it's obviously not going to match the interface. So you just have to make sure that they match each other. But yeah. The other thing that I was going to say as an observation is another place that uh, inversion of control and dependency injections often used is in unit tests. So if you have right. code that, for instance, one of your nested dependencies is going to actually go and send those uh, SMS messages, obviously you don't want to send a bunch of SMS messages uh, when you run your unit test. So instead, it will instantiate a unit test provider for your you know, SMS service. Right. This like line here where you bind, that can happen in any program that has the basic dependencies of the IOC framework. And whatever this is binding should work in isolation from the entire framework. So. If you do it right, I guess. <laughs> All right, let's give a big round of applause. Okay.